Hello, and welcome to History 361, Lecture 13, Slavery and the Coming of the Civil War. This is African American History to 1877 at New Mexico State University. I am Professor Jamie Bronstein, and I'm going to be talking about the 1850s today. One of the precipitating factors, really the main precipitating factor for the Civil War, was the acquisition by the United States of Western territory, and then the struggle over whether that territory would be free states or slave states. Between 1830 and 1860, hundreds of thousands of Americans moved West, including Native Americans and slaves who were forcibly relocated. American acquisition of Mexican territory, as we're going to see, reignited the debate about slavery in the territories. Even though Mexico had formally abolished slavery, by 1830, the more than 20,000 Americans who had settled in the Mexican province of Texas had reintroduced slavery and 2,000 enslaved people to the territory. The refusal of white Americans who had moved to Mexican Texas to take up Mexican citizenship, convert to Catholicism, and give up their slaves precipitated a war between those immigrants and the Mexican government and led to the establishment of an official country of Texas in 1836. In 1845, Texas was admitted to the Union as a slave state. Northerners were convinced that the move was a demonstration of something they called the slave power conspiracy. That was a conspiracy by Southern states to use the courts and the legislature to take away rights from Northern whites, including the right to ban slavery from their states. These conspiratorial beliefs invigorated the Liberty Party, which I mentioned in the last lecture. The Liberty Party was founded in 1840 and was dedicated to the abolition of slavery. The um, Liberty Party in 1844 received nine times the number of votes that it had in 1840. So it was uh, becoming more of an issue, the issue of whether the Western states would be slave states or free states. By the time the Oregon Territory was admitted to the Union as a free state in 1848, and the United States had gone to war with Mexico, Americans had begun to embrace the idea that America had a manifest destiny to settle the West. Um, that is, that God or Providence had marked them out for the special um, dispensation to have the entire continent in order to bring to it the best possible political and religious system. The nation, however, was closely watching and keeping careful tally of the number of free and slave states admitted um, because they didn't want one section to dominate over another in Congress. So the war with Mexico lasted from 1846 to 1848, and it was really a war that the United States started, that we wanted to happen. I mean, we had offered California um, money, or offered Mexico money for California. The Mexican government turned us down, and then uh, the president at the time, James K. Polk, sent troops to a disputed area of southern Texas on the border with Mexico to see if he couldn't get the Mexican troops to, uh, to fight against the American troops, and that is how the war started. During the war, Pennsylvania Democratic Representative David Wilmot introduced the Wilmot Proviso, which called for a ban on slavery in any territories acquired from Mexico, but the bill, the bill failed to pass in the Senate. And so it was clear that any territory that came in after the war with Mexico uh, might be slave territory. In 1848, the United States completed its victory over Mexico with the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, which gave the nation present-day California, New Mexico, Utah, and all of Texas north of the Rio Grande. The discovery of gold in California drew prospectors, including more than 4,000 free African Americans. But one of the big issues about the so-called Mexican cession, or the amount of land that Mexico had conceded to the United States, 
was that almost all of it fell below the line of 36 degrees 30 minutes of latitude that had been established during the Missouri Compromise. Thus, a large number of slave states could theoretically be admitted to the Union. There was a big debate about California statehood and whether it was going to, whether admitting California as a free state was going to imbalance um, the free state slave state divide. And the debate was getting kind of acrimonious until once again Henry Clay of Kentucky stepped in and brokered a compromise, which historians with their, you know, wealth of creativity have called the Compromise of 1850. It didn't completely satisfy either side of the debate, but attempted to navigate what was becoming an increasingly vexed topic. The Compromise of 1850 did the following. It admitted California as a free state, abolished slave sales in the District of Columbia, allowed the people in New Mexico and Utah territories to decide the slavery question themselves, and as a concession to the South, enacted a new fugitive slave law. The Compromise of 1850 also brought forth the idea of popular sovereignty. So popular sovereignty was a notion that for any future states to enter the Union, the people of that relevant territory could vote to determine what kind of state they wanted to be. On the right here, you have a card um, telling people uh, people of color to be careful. Uh, vigilance committees that I'm going to talk about momentarily um, let people know whenever there were slave catchers in the North. The Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 was definitely the most controversial part of the Compromise of 1850. It was an act that made it easier for runaway enslaved people to be captured and returned to their masters. Northerners, many of them, opposed the law. Many northern states had passed personal liberty laws that forbade the kidnapping and forced return of fugitives. Personal liberty laws had been ruled unconstitutional in the 1842 case of Prigg versus Pennsylvania, but the Supreme Court did say apprehending fugitives is a federal matter. You can't make state officials assist with the apprehension of fugitive slaves. The new act changed this. It required federal marshals to pursue alleged fugitive slaves and federal commissioners were appointed to oversee runaway cases. These officials received $10 for a runaway return to the claimant and $5 for a runaway set free. So if you were a uh, free black person and somebody claimed you as their runaway slave, the federal marshal in question or the federal commissioner had a motivation, a monetary motivation, for returning you to your uh, alleged master, even if you were a free person. Northerners were most angered by the fact that federal marshals were authorized to make citizen bystanders help capture fugitives. Bystanders who refused to help could be fined $1,000 and sent to, to jail for six months. Even Northerners who hadn't given much thought to slavery were angered by what appeared to be federal government overreach. So the Fugitive Slave Act was another cornerstone of the so-called slave power conspiracy. The new law frightened African Americans because even those who had escaped slavery years before could re be returned to bondage. So they started fleeing from the United States, going to Canada, Mexico, and Europe for safety. The new law also put free blacks at risk, as I mentioned a moment ago. During the 1850s, 296, 296 of 330 fugitives formally arrested or 90% suffered re-enslavement. But as I said, you know, it wasn't always people who had been slaves, but also people who had never been slaves who were kidnapped and brought to the South. You may be familiar with the movie 12 Years a Slave, it is based on the personal narrative of Solomon Northup. Northup was born free in New York State. He was lured to the District of Columbia by two men 
who promised to hire him as a musician. He was a talented fiddle player. They promised him work in a circus only to drug him. And he woke up with shackles on. He was sold into slavery. He lived in captivity in Louisiana for the next 12 years. Every time he protested that he was a free man, his master beat him. Only a chance encounter with a white man who was willing to tell his family that he was still alive regained him his freedom. Okay, so you see on the right here more um, publicity by those vigilance committees letting people know that slave catchers are in the area. After the Fugitive Slave Act was passed, vigilance committees, which had one time been all black, became increasingly interracial. These committees were on the lookout for slave catchers and expanded the network of cellars, church basements, and other safe places where refugees could hide. William Still and Harriet Tubman were important leaders of the Underground Railroad and Vigilance Committee Anti-Slavery Network. Tubman, who was a runaway herself, personally traveled to the South at least 14 times to help 130 slaves escape. Um, still, William Still published his stories about the network in the 1872 book, The Underground Railroad. In September 1851, near Christiana, Pennsylvania, a U.S. Marshal and a party of slaveholders demanded to search the home of two runaway enslaved people named Eliza and William Parker. Eliza sounded a large horn that summoned more than 75 local supporters to their home where they killed a slaveholder and wounded his son. The Parkers and other fugitives they were harboring escaped to Canada, but three white Quakers and 35 black people were arrested for treason under the Fugitive Slave Act. Congressman Thaddeus Stevens assisted in their defense and eventually the charges were dropped. So blood was shed over the question of the Fugitive Slave Act and people were willing to exercise civil disobedience, both white and black people, to uh, protect these refugees from the South. Finally, Harriet Beecher Stowe's novel Uncle Tom's Cabin, published in 1852, graphically portrayed slavery's devastating effects on families, encouraging empathy with the victims of slavery to increase support for abolition. And fugitives play a, a large role in Uncle Tom's Cabin. This is a little detail at left here from a, an engraving of the incident at Christiana. In 1854, Stephen Douglas, who was a Democratic senator from Illinois, promoted the Kansas-Nebraska Act, a new piece of legislation that was designed to deal with the territories of Kansas and Nebraska coming into the Union. The Kansas-Nebraska Act allowed settlers in those two territories to exercise popular sovereignty, that is, to decide whether they would become free or slave states. The act inspired a series of violent confrontations between pro-slavery and anti-slavery forces as advocates of each flocked into the territories simply to establish residency so that they could vote. In 1856, pro-slavery forces from Missouri attacked the anti-slavery town of Lawrence, Kansas, and John Brown, a self-appointed captain of anti-slavery forces, took revenge by murdering five pro-slavery settlers at Pottawatomie Creek, actually dragging them from their tents and uh, hacking them up with axes in front of their screaming families. Soon these bloody battles over slavery in Kansas were a low-level civil war situation within the state of Kansas, earning it the nickname Bleeding Kansas. Uh, one of the things that happened in the same week as the Pottawatomie Creek Massacre was uh, violence, which had been growing and growing throughout the 1850s, broke out in Congress with the caning of anti-slavery Senator Charles Sumner of Massachusetts by um, Congressional Representative Preston Brooks. And there is a, um, a depiction of that going on here at the right hand side of the uh, screen. Charles Sumner had given a speech against slavery in which he had implicated a senator by the name of A.P. Butler, 
Butler happened to be President or uh, Preston Brooks's uncle, and Sumner had some very harsh words for Butler, saying that he had taken the harlot slavery for his mistress and all kinds of stuff that um, Brooks. Uh, interpreted as a stain on his Southern honor. So he came into the Senate and beat Charles Sumner with a cane so, so vigorously that he broke the cane and gave Sumner permanent neurological damage. Now, this is just one of the many outbreaks of violence that occurred in the legislature in the 1850s. People were pulling guns on each other, pulling knives on each other. So it's my contention, really, that the outbreak of violence was one of the main things that um, differentiates the 1850s from other times of sectional tension in American history. Another thing that added to this was the disintegration of the Whig Party and the emergence of a new party, the Republican Party, which was opposed to slavery. Now, the Democratic Party at this point stood firm on a pro-slavery agenda, and so the parties that emerged were sectional. That is, rather than uniting the country by having adherents in both North and South, the Democratic Party was largely a Southern party, and then the uh, Republican Party was a Northern party. Um, so the Republican Party, as we're going to see, plays a large role in the 1860 election. But just remember, it's a party that um, has an official anti-slavery message, or at least anti the uh, introduction of slavery into the new territories message, and is pretty much confined to the North. The Dred Scott decision was in a way the straw that broke the camel's back, especially on the slave power conspiracy question. As you may know, in 1846, enslaved couple Dred and Harriet Scott uh, sued for their freedom. For two years, they had lived with their master in Illinois and in Wisconsin Territory and actually in Louisiana, northern Louisiana, prior to moving back to the slave state of Missouri. Their master had promised to free them, but had reneged on the promise, and some white abolitionist friends helped them to file a lawsuit. The lawsuit went all the way to the Supreme Court, and in the case of Dred Scott versus Sanford, the court decided against Dred Scott, ruling that he, first of all, wasn't free just because he had lived in a free territory where slavery was outlawed, because as a non-citizen, he was not entitled to sue. The court further ruled that African Americans couldn't be citizens of the United States, that it was the intention of the Founding Fathers never to allow this, that when the Declaration of Independence said all men are created equal, that they were not talking about black people, and that Congress and white people quite, quote, had no right to, uh, or no rights that any white man was bound to respect. Chief Justice Roger Taney went so far as to say the Missouri Compromise was unconstitutional because you could not tell Southern white people where they could bring their property. That telling people that there was no slavery north of 36, 30 minutes of latitude was preventing them from freely bringing their property to the north. And so it was a kind of unconstitutional taking. All right. So this... This was a court decision that went rather far. If normally somebody doesn't have standing to sue, you just say, we're not going to take the case, or at the very most, X person doesn't have standing to sue and here's why. But Tani went way farther than that by saying the Missouri Compromise was unconstitutional. Black leaders such as Frederick Douglass and Robert Purvis blasted the decision Douglas calling the ruling judicial wolfishness. In the wake of the decision, many black people left the United States. Some fled to Canada, which by 1860 had a sizable black population. Black leaders such as H. Ford Douglas, Marianne Shad Carey, and Martin Delaney fled to Canada. And black nationalism, which evolved from the idea of black self-reliance, 
into black self-determination and called for an independent black nation became the rallying cry of those who were disillusioned by the Dred Scott decision. Martin Delaney was the father of black nationalism. He talked about how African Americans should immigrate to many different places, Canada, Central and South America, the West Indies, and West Africa. The first National Emigration Convention was held in Cleveland in 1854, and by 1859, Delaney and Robert Campbell, a Jamaican chemist, traveled to Africa in search of land for settlement along the Niger River Valley. James Theodore Holly, an Episcopalian priest and missionary, argued for emigration to Haiti, and he led 101 black people to an ill-fated, short-lived settlement there. Black nationalism really emerges much more as an important ideology in the early 20th century. And if you take um, History 362, the second half of this African-American history survey, you will learn much more about that, um, including the Garveyite movement uh, for emigration of African-Americans. Okay, so... The next thing that happened in 1859, um, John Brown, who you will remember from the 1856 Pottawatomie massacre, he had gone underground for a while. He had, he was always very religiously committed and he decided that he needed to lead a revolution on slavery. He made a big plan for a raid on a federal arsenal at Harper's Ferry, Virginia, got 21 men, including several African-Americans to join him in his raid. They crossed the Potomac in the dead of night. They shot the night watchman at the armory who happened to be an African-American guy. They took the armory and then expected that they were going to be joined by all kinds of enslaved people who were going to rush down to the armory and take up arms against their masters. Uh, that didn't happen. It's partly a question of geography. If you look at where Harper's Ferry Armory is located, it was really delusional of them to think anybody was going to be able to come there and take up arms. Anyway, they were quickly surrounded by the Virginia militia. Um, federal troops came. Uh, ten of Brown's comrades were killed, including two of Brown's sons. Uh, several of the militia, Brown's militia, were captured. And ultimately, Brown was also captured, although he was severely injured. Um, during the raid. As news spread of the sensational raid, reports inflamed the conspiratorial views that the slave South and free North had of each other. Pro-slavery advocates saw Brown as a madman and a terrorist and contended that the North intended to destroy their way of life. And black and white abolitionists lauded Brown and his comrades as martyrs. Before his execution in December of 1859, Brown handed a note to, jail, to his jailer in which he predicted that slavery would not end without very much bloodshed. All right, so John Brown was executed uh, just a couple months after the raid on Harper's Ferry Armory happened, and that leads us up to the election of 1860. The presidential election of 1860 can be considered the catalyst for the Civil War, um, it, you know, more than any of the things I've talked about today. The Republican candidate in 1860 was Abraham Lincoln. Americans were somewhat familiar with Lincoln because in 1858, he had run for the Illinois Senate seat occupied by Stephen Douglas. And during those debates, during the uh, Lincoln-Douglas debates, Stephen Douglas characterized him as an abolitionist. He wasn't really an abolitionist. He was a member of the Republican Party, which was dedicated to not expanding slavery into the West. But at the beginning of the Civil War, he was not an abolitionist. However, when the 1860 presidential election happened, uh, Lincoln's party was not even on the ballot in many Southern states. So... The northern and southern wings of the Democratic Party ran separate candidates in 1860. There was something called the Constitutional Union Party, which uh, ran, ran John Bell as their 
candidate that got a little bit of traction, as you can see in the yellow here in the border states. Douglas, for the Northern Democrats, only uh, got nine electoral votes. Uh, Breckenridge, the Southern Democrat, carried the South. But I want you to notice how few electoral votes those Southern states have compared to the Northern states. Even the counting of enslaved people toward representation in the census was not enough to overcome the advantage that the North reaped from immigration from Europe. All right, so Lincoln won 39% of the popular vote. He vowed not to dislave, uh, disturb slavery where it already existed, but he won the electoral vote without any issue of, you know, there being a tie or anything like that. South Carolina reacted right away to Lincoln's election by issuing Articles of Secession in December 1860. The Articles of Secession, like those of all Southern states to follow South Carolina out of the Union, said the main reason that they were dissolving the Union was because of slavery. They needed to protect the institution of slavery. In total, 11 states would eventually secede forming themselves into an alternative polity that they called the Confederate States of America. The CSA had its own constitution, patterned after the U.S. Constitution, but explicitly protective of slavery. All right, so uh, that is what is going to lead to the Civil War, the election of 1860, the perception on the part of the South that slavery was in danger, and their decision to secede from the Union and start their own alternative country, so to speak, the Confederate States of America. All right, that's it. See you in the comments.